All right, um, we're going to get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jenny Akuda, and I'm an assistant professor in physical science and at the Kinder Institute here at the University of Missouri Columbia. Um, it's our great pleasure here at Kinder to welcome you all to this roundtable during Black History Month to celebrate the volume edited by Melvin Rogers and Jack Turner, African American Political Thought, A Collected History, published by the University of Chicago Press in 2021. Um, it really is a marvelous, highly anticipated volume of 30 essays by 30 scholars on 30 thinkers um, in African American thought from Phyllis Wheatley to Cornell West. Um, the volume is, in the words of the editors, a provisional canon. Um, it both sets, I think, a really high standard for the study of African American political thought. And it also shows us that African American thought is indispensable to political theory, not only, but especially for those of us who study American political thought and intellectual history. Um, having spent some time reading the volume, I can say it's a really wonderful resource for both students and scholars. Like everyone should go out and buy it. It's a great text for those of us um, who are encountering thinkers such as Anna Julia Cooper or Huey Newton or Toni Morrison for the first time. Um, and for those of us already familiar with the work of these thinkers, um, these essays also generate new arguments that advance the field. Um, so I really want to highlight just how fabulous the volume is and to thank the editors, Melvin and Jack, for all of their labor. Um, so to celebrate this, we've put together the roundtable of the editors and a few of the volume's contributors. And I'll try to go, friend. Here. Um, the editors are Melvin Rogers and Jack Turner. Melvin Rogers is Associate Professor of Political Science at Brown University, and Jack Turner is Associate mm -hmm. Professor of Political Science at the University of Washington. Um, in addition to editing this volume, they also contributed their own essays. Melvin wrote the piece on David Walker, and Jack, wrote, and Jack Turner wrote the piece on Audre Lorde. Um, we're also really fortunate to be joined by three of the volume's contributors today. Lori Balfour is the James Hart Professor of Politics at the University of Virginia and wrote the piece on Toni Morrison. Um, Carol Wayne White is the presidential professor in the philosophy of religion at Bucknell University and wrote on Anna Julia Cooper. Finally, Cedric Johnson is associate professor of political science and African American studies at the University of Illinois Chicago and wrote the piece on Huey Newton. Um, so I'm first going to invite the volumes editors to talk about um, the text broadly, why they decided to put it together, what that experience was like, um, and how they understand you know, the relationship between African American thought and American political thought and intellectual history more broadly. Um, they'll then bring in Lori, Cedric, and Carol into the conversation. Um, and after that, we'll open it up to QA. Um, so if anyone in the audience would like to ask a question, um, please let me know in the chat box and I'll start keeping a cue. Um, so with that, I'll turn things over to Jack and Melvin. Uh, thanks, Jenny. I'm going to start us off today and I really want to uh, extend our thanks to uh, Jenny Aikuda and Allison Smythe for all the organizational work that they did on this roundtable. We're really honored to be here today and uh, Jenny is producing some really important work in the field of African American political thought right now and so we're really honored uh, by her decision to host this event. African American political thought, a collective history is a product of friendship. In the fall of 1997, Melvin Rogers and I met for the first time when we both took a course called Philosophy, Race, and Racism, taught at Amherst College by Robert Gooding Williams. Melvin and I became fast friends. We both had interests in political theory and Black history, and we were both shaped by the remarkable intellectual activity going on in Amherst Department of Black Studies at that time, led by Bob, the historian David Blight, and the Harlem Renaissance scholar Jeffrey B. Ferguson. Melvin and I stayed friends as we went to graduate school at different institutions and corresponded about our emerging interests in American uh, transcendentalism, American pragmatism, critical race theory, and African-American political thought. As we exchanged our early work in this last field, we began to think about the contours of African-American political thought as a field of study and in relation to Atlantic world traditions of political theory. One day in 2007, we came up with the idea of putting together a collected history of the field, a book akin to Leo Strauss's and Joseph Cropsey's History of Political Philosophy, but focused on Black thinkers. In 2011, we committed to doing the project, recruiting 28 colleagues to come along on this journey. Now, 11 years later, we present this work to you. It is first essential to note the shoulders we stand on. There are scholars in Black studies, women's studies, philosophy, history, law, literature, and political science who've long insisted on the importance of African-American writers, 
as sources of political reflection. Partial lists of these works are Leonard Harris's 1983 philosophy book, Born of Struggle, Cedric Robinson's 1983 Black Marxism, Patricia Hill Collins 1990 Black Feminist Thought, Bernard Boxel's 1992 Two Traditions of African American Philosophy, Beverly Guy Scheftel's 1995 Words of Fire, Michael Dawson's 2001 Black Visions, and Robert Gooding Williams 2009 In the Shadow of Du Bois. Our work extends theirs by offering a collected history. 30 chapters on 30 African-American thinkers from Phyllis Wheatley to Cornell West, written by 30 scholars spanning political science, philosophy, history, English, religious studies, legal studies, and black studies. Why this collected history approach? We chose this approach first because we believe that the study of African-American political thought needs to become more thinker-centered. Much of the prominent scholarship on African-American political thought of the last quarter century divides the field into a taxonomy of broad ideologies, Black Marxism, Black feminism, Black nationalism, Black liberalism, and so on. Individual thinkers are then categorized and situated within these ideologies. This approach is valuable because it helps us understand thinkers in terms of the largest, larger histories, many tied to social movements of which they are a part. The price, however, is obscuring the individuality of Black minds, the way the thinking of individual writers draw on multiple traditions simultaneously and exceeds any given conceptual mapping. Our aim is not to displace the ideological approach. Our aim is rather to supplement and counterbalance it with a thinker-centered approach that can give us a more granular view of particular minds. We chose this his collected history approach second because it enables us to achieve a breadth and depth of study that would be virtually impossible to achieve in a single authored volume. This in turn enables us to more fully display African-American political thoughts and intellectual diversity, the variety of its rhetorical approaches, from Martin Delaney's use of Roman political concepts to explain racial domination, chapter three by Robert Gooding Williams, to Toni Morrison's novelistic imagination of new forms of democratic responsibility, chapter 24 by Lori Balfour. The collected history format also allows us to display a diversity of interpretive methods from close philosophical analysis of a single pamphlet, such as David Walker's Appeal, chapter two by Melvin Rogers, to deciphering how an individual thinker such as Zora Neale Hurston synthesizes ideologies as seemingly opposed as political conservatism and proto-feminism, chapter 13 by Farrah Jasmine Griffin. Before turning to Melvin, let me say a final word about what I think is one of the volume's most important contributions. Elaborating a thinker-centered account of African-American political thought automatically involves a second intervention the reconstitution of US political thought itself. The trailblazing black historian, Nathan I. Huggins, always insisted that African-American history is American history, that researching and narrating the story of black Americans automatically entails revising our historical understanding of the United States at large. Studying slavery in colonial Virginia, for example, forces us to revise our understanding of the sources of American ideas of freedom. Those sources were not only the minds of Harrington, Sidney, Locke, and Montesquieu, but also the lived experience of slavery. As Edmund Morgan observed, the presence of men and women who were, quote, almost totally subject to the will of other men gave slave owners like Washington, Jefferson, and Madison an immediate experience of what it could mean to be at the mercy of a tyrant. Virginians may have had a special appreciation of the freedom dear to Republicans because they saw every day what life without it could be like, end quote. On the basis of revisionist history such as Morgan's, Huggins concluded, quote, African-American history and American history are not only essential to one another, they share a common historical fate, end quote. Melvin's and my teacher at Amherst, Jeffrey Ferguson, who was a student of Huggins, taught us to see black history and US history in this way. Jeff is the author of chapter 14 on George Schuyler. He died in 2018 after finishing his essay, but before we had finished the book. And what we hope is a fitting gesture, Melvin and I have dedicated the book to Jeff's memory. It is with Jeff in mind that I conclude today 
by echoing Huggins. African-American political thought and American political thought are not only essential to one another, they share a common historical fate. Thank you. So Chip, thank you for those remarks. Jenny, uh, Allison, thank you for the, uh, uh, the invitation and for hosting us. And I wanna thank all of you for joining us. Uh, I'll say a few words to, to sort of extend Chip's remarks and then I will uh, ask the panelists to join us and reflecting on uh, uh, their experience uh, in writing uh, on their specific thinkers and in writing in a volume such as this. So let me extend Chip's remarks by um, uh, reflecting on what we take to be one of um, what we hope are many important contributions, um, and that is to our understanding of, of democracy. So democracy, both as an ideal and a practice, is, as many of you know, on the ropes these days. The persistence of racial inequality, the growing fact of economic inequality and the sense of political decay have made many of us question whether democracy is up to the task of making good on the very many promises it has offered. And when we think of, uh, at least from the perspective of the introduction, when we think of democracy, we have in mind the moral proposition that ordinary everyday individuals can be left to their own devices to engage in self-governance and they can do so uh, without needing to bow to bosses or kings. That moral proposition displays itself, I think, in the importance we accord the franchise, the right to vote, the importance we attach to deliberation discussion for working through our disagreements and the way in which the, the first two work to guard against uh, various forms of uh, economic and uh, institutional forces um, that would threaten to uh, dominate us. All three of these features, the right to vote, the importance of deliberation, and the aversion and resistance to domination form central parts of the tradition of African-American political thought. And here I give you just one example. Right in 1865, five years before the ratification of the 15th Amendment, Frederick Douglass, I think captured the point quite nicely. Here is Douglas, by depriving us of suffrage, you affirm our incapacity to form an intelligent judgment respecting public measures. I want the elective franchise for one as a colored man because ours is a peculiar government based upon a peculiar idea and that idea is universal suffrage, end quote. Now others, Anna Julia Cooper, Ida B. Wells, to take two examples, would join him in this sentiment even as they sought to expand the reach of the franchise. But if African-Americans stress the importance of the franchise in one sense, they also emphasize the life of democracy, the life of democracy that for them extends well beyond the formal practices of voting. There is no way to read, to deploy another selection of chapters. There's no way to read uh, David Walker in chapter two, Anna Julia Cooper in chapter eight, Toni Morrison in chapter 24, or Audrey Lorde in chapter 26 and not see that democracy is a cultural enterprise and that the franchise and our defense of it requires a culture in which we are rightly oriented to each other, a culture in which care and concern figure prominently. Building up a healthy democratic culture for many in this book requires richer ways of talking with each other, different resources that might enrich our conversational or discursive practices. So whether it is the deployment of religious claims, the intense display of emotions in communicating the gravity of one's grievances, or the performance of protests via marchings and sit-ins, all of these have worked as reasons for organizing political society one way rather than another. All of these have functioned as ways of speaking to the public, even in cases when what was being used was one's very body. Now this last invocation of the body, I think gets at something very important for all of us to keep in mind as we work through the book, as we talk today. Living in a political society such as ours involves some disappointment interdependence comes obviously with its challenges. But the idea is that disappointment will never be permanent. 
The figures in this book put front and center for us different levels of disappointment and a different level of harm exposure that Black people have and continue to experience. The thinkers in this book ask us to focus on forms of danger and violence that are unspecified in advance and could enter at any moment. The thinkers in this volume use this, what we might now call this radical form of vulnerability, what we call uh, racial domination in the introduction of the book, as the basis for thinking about and struggling with the health of democracy in the United States. And they force us to structure our vision of democracy, its cultural and institutional supports by beginning with the terror of radical vulnerability. Let me finally say, now in gesturing toward the ways in which African-American political thought might transform our theorizing about democracy, it should not be thought that all of the figures in this volume stand in an affirmative relationship to democracy, especially US democracy. Martin Delaney, Ida B. Wells, Marcus Garvey, the late W.B. Du Bois, Stokely Carmichael, and uh, Huey Newton all had deep doubts about the United States' capacity to be a just society where Black people were concerned. In the final analysis, and after considering, considering the arc of the volume, readers will need to decide for themselves just how one should understand democracy as a social practice, and in particular, its connection to the harm and violence that Black people have and continue to experience in, uh, in the United States. So I will come back to this theme. I think we'll come back to this theme of racial domination as a form of radical vulnerability. But I want to begin to sort of shift to uh, the other uh, participants, writers in the volume. And I want to ease us. Uh, ease us into our discussion uh, and ask um, uh, Lori, Cedric, and Carol to reflect uh, for us, to reflect on uh, their experience uh, writing for the volume, their experience with their individual figures uh, that they uh, decided to take up, that they were invited to take up. I mean, just what is it uh, in their estimation it's what is being offered by their, by their thinkers um, to the readers uh, in their own time and to us today. Um, so uh, that's the question to the panelists. Any one of you can begin that uh, conversation. Why don't we go in chronological order? We're going to start with, with Carol. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chip and Mel Melvin. Um, it's a pleasure to see Laurie and Cedric, and thank you, Jenny, for the wonderful invitation. Thank you, Allison. And I greet everyone else who's present here today. Thank you all. Um, so thank you for that question, um, Melvin. Um, I, I'm enamored of Anna Julia Cooper. I've been reading her work for a while. And she has definitely inspired me. I feel as if um, she's in my blood, if I can say that. Um, and one of the things that has inspired me about her as a figure, as, as an historical figure, is her thinking. She, she's, she's a theorist. And at a time when very few people of African descent and within context of, of United States um, were living, very few were constructing a view of humanity on which democratic principles and values could be um, advanced. And this is what I see Cooper doing in her work. She basically envisioned a new model of humanity, relational humanity, in which particular political and ethical values could be advanced and crystallized within um, North America. She was in love with the idea of a transformed America, as I am. Um, she was in love with the idea of what America could be, not what it was. And um, in her writing, in her activism, in her 
um, community work in her educational efforts. She promoted democratic principles and values um, that were not as visible or articulated by some of the dominant white figures, leaders, and even some of her um, Afri African-American male peers. So she, she stands in these various camps and articulates a vision um, of democracy that one could say is still emerging. Uh, we're, we're in an age where we say we're fighting for it, but for, for Cooper, um, this idealization of America never um, manifests itself during her time, but she believed that it could. Um, and one other thing I really love about her work is that she loved black excellence. She loved um, the cultivation of black genius. She loved the cultivation of um, blacks sharing in a culture making project that we call America. She also spoke to various audiences. She was an intersectional thinker during her time. Um, she saw that what she called racial prejudice was not just confined to the plight of African-Americans. She talked about the uh, plight of indigenous cultures, cultures um, within the pluralistic America of her day, many different minoritized um, communities and identities. She spoke to those. And so she was um, a forward, forward thinker in terms of what we think about today. Um, so I love her. I think that I'm living through her in a certain way. And I believe in her vision as well. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Can I just ask a quick follow-up question, Carol? Because yes. one thing that you said really struck me, which is that that both Cooper and you are in love with the idea of a transformed America. Yeah. And in left academia right now, that is very out of fashion. Exactly. So I wanted to. I wanted to. I wanted to get a sense. For, uh, get a sense for you. Why? Why in in a time when that idea is so out of fashion, why do you hold on to it? And why do you think Cooper holds on to it, even though she's not? She can't access her fashions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chip. I, I think it's because she. I think Cooper is coming from a place in which uh, she wants to honor those who have come before her, who have fought long and hard to exist in this country and is not willing to give that up. So one could say she's a dreamer. One could say that she uh, really believes in um, the values of democracy, that um, she doesn't want to let go of that. There, and I, I'm not, she's an interested humanistic thinker for me who also uh, is very, very, uh, savvy about the material conditions that don't allow you to actualize yourself as a human being. And I think that she loves humanity as well, if I can say that. And um, if not a transformed US citizen, what are we fighting for? What are we fighting for if we're not fighting for our humanity when we think about democratic values and all? So I think that's why. That's a great occasion and turn to Cedric and his chapter on Huey Newton. So Cedric, do you want to explain, tell us a little bit about sort of your intellectual journey writing that chapter? Sure. Um, let me just start. I want to thank uh, Jenny and the Kinder Institute for organizing this event. And, um, you know, thanks to everyone for turning out. I also want to take this moment, as I have in the past, I feel like I always have to, to thank uh, Melvin and Chip for organizing this volume. I mean, I think we all owe them a debt of, of gratitude. This was a, a, a project that took a, te was a test of endurance, I'm sure, uh, perseverance. <laughs> and, and they were able to pull it off in, in you know, stunning fashion. And so I'm, I'm happy to be a part of that, to have been a part of that journey. Um, there were moments, you know, during the, the, uh, the making of this project 
uh, some of the conferences that were that were held in in uh, Seattle as well as Los Angeles, where um, you know they were uplifting for me as a as a scholar and as somebody who was struggling through uh, mid career travails, right? To be in those spaces where um, not only was my intellectual community being expanded, right, through this this interactions that Melvin and Chip created, but then you know having a chance to meet people whose work I had had embraced you know, since graduate school, right? There were moments in some of those, those uh, conferences when I felt that my, my bookshelves had come alive, right? And I was sitting around across the table from folks who had been studying for so long. So this has been great uh, on so many levels and I'm honored to have been a part of, of this project. That being said, I mean, I had some misgivings about taking on Huey Newton as a figure, right? I think that there's some figures that are much easier um, to talk about as far as uh, African-American uh, intellectual history. And uh, given Newton's own uh, personal failings and struggles as a human being, right? At first I recoiled, but then ultimately it was a project that helped me to gain a deeper understanding of him as a figure. And I hope the essay that I wrote um, does the same, right? Um, my relationship with Huey Newton goes back to at least the 1980s, right? I am somebody who came of age during the, the golden age of hip hop music, uh, politicized uh, rap music of the late 80s was huge for me. And as everybody can recall, um, that, that music uh, celebrated many of the fallen figures of the civil rights and black power period. And, and Huey Newton was foremost uh, among those um, sadly, my graduation from high school, that year that I graduated, coincided with Huey Newton's death um, in, the, in the midst of a drug deal uh, gone wrong, right? I think, in a way, Newton came to represent for many of us, right alongside uh, people like, uh, you know, uh, Lynn Bias, folks like uh, Ben Wilson here in Chicago, uh, as well as Marion Barry. Um, all of these men represented the, the extent of not only the, the crack, you know, crack cocaine crisis, right, up to a point, but also the kind of, of policing and repression and, and ordinary violence that was a part of that time. And so, you know, Newton's uh, ending was most certainly tragic. And in a way, his life, um, you know, from beginning to end, really reflects so many important turns within Black life in the second half of the 20th century, right? He's a part of the westward migration from uh, Louisiana to California. He uh, comes of age amidst the civil rights and Black power uh, period. He's one of the key architects as far as, uh, you know, organizational founding of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense architects of Black power. Uh, he also is one of the first, you know, along with the Panthers, the first to really begin to lay bare uh, the kind of role that prisons are coming to play and police are playing within urban areas uh, long before the term mass incarceration becomes common coin. And of course he feels the brunt of state repression during that period, right? So there's, there's a way in which he, he, um, you know, again, reflects and experiences so many different turns. Uh, I would add one more. He also is part of the migration of black radicals into academia during the 1970s, right? So there's so many great things about him and about his experience that, um, that we need to think through. I think what he brings to the conversation in his own time, and, and this, I'll talk about this in two ways. There's the way in which he and Bobby Seale and other members of the, the Black Panther Party helped to popularize this idea that Black people constitute uh, an internal colony within the United States. Um, I don't, I mean, I don't agree with that. And I think there are important criticisms to be made of that even during the 1960s, but it's powerful in a way in terms of orienting uh, Black political life away from American uh, democratic politics and towards this broader uh, international set of events, in particular um, decolonization struggles in different parts of the world and wars against American 
uh, imperialism, right? It's really funny. I've had a couple of battles. This is just a sidebar. Battles in the last couple of years as so many editors have become woke. Um, editors who've wanted, in two sentences, uh, wanted to change the word third world. They want to take that out of one of my essays because they were concerned about how it would land, right? So on some level, they, they, they want to be correct, but it's not like wokeness actually leads towards um, you know, good historical understanding, right? The fact that third world was actually a really progressive term to use uh, and embraced by you know, black activists across the country and, and enshrined in organizations like the Third World Women's Alliance and you know, Third World Press, which still exists here in Chicago. But I think Newton is important in that regard, right, for popularizing this, this set of ideas, for turning our attention or thinking about um, Black political struggles as connected to uh, those in other parts of, of the, the world. Where I'll, where I'll end, at least this part of my, my uh, commentary, is I think he realizes the limitations of that as a form of, of politics. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that, right? So on one level, Newton sees the black ghetto uh, along with Eldridge Cleaver and you know, everyone else as this base of political power. But as um, black power is operationalized in the form of black control of formal institutions of governing in different cities, I think it becomes clear to them that that position is, is in some ways um, untenable. And so by the time Newton emerges from, from jail, uh, and resumes his work within the Black Panther Party, we see him moving away from uh, an embrace of that particular uh, type of politics and a focus from moving from um, Blacks as an internal colony towards an emphasis on uh, what he would call uh, inner communalism. The last thing, I know I said that would be the last thing, but one, one more last thing. Um, in preparing for today's talk, I mean, I, what, what I thought quickly about was the way that Newton and the Panthers still speak to a major conundrum on the American left during the 1960s that in many ways is still with us. And that's how do you make socialist revolution on American soil, uh, which was what, that, this is what they were concerned about, right? At a time when the majority of Americans were veering towards deeper commitments to American liberal democratic capitalism, right? Uh, is it possible, wrapped up within that same uh, set of concerns, is it possible for Blacks to serve as a vanguard, which is what Newton and other Black power uh, advocates had hoped, when the rest of the country is not prepared to move in the same direction? So can we have uh, a legitimate and real and powerful left um, when the, those who are willing to take the most risk are still in the minority would be one way to, to, to frame that. So Cedric, can I, um, I have a question. I mean, I really, I was rereading the, you all have to read it, uh, it was the, the, the entire book, but, but I was rereading uh, your chapter this morning, which is just absolutely extraordinary. I guess we've now read these things to 10, 20 times, I don't know. Um, but, but one of the things that, that stood out to me and it's connected to this last point that you made about uh, a, a vanguard politics. Um, and it's a different kind of conundrum. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a way in which the story of vanguard politics um, participates in an, interesting, in an interesting critique of black life mm -hmm. and the sort of um, impoverished nature of black culture. Mm. That in an interest that overlaps with the liberal critique uh, mm. of black culture of the 60s. Mm. And you say that that Newton's that some of Newton's criticisms emerge out of and then suggest a closer proximity between him and the kind of liberal culture of poverty kind of critique. Mm. But what's fascinating is, and I want to I want you to say more about this, is that why is it that Newton both can it can sort of play in that sort of uh, that sort of idiom, um, and yet not? How did he not succumb to the kind of blaming the victim game? Mm. In other words, how did he 
manage to bring health, you know, to bring a critique to bear that otherwise would make a great many people, particularly now, very suspicious, but without lapsing into um, blame the victim game that you might, you know, I still would associate, you know, um, uh, you sort of see this, I think you see clear pieces of it in the Moynihan report. And much earlier, you see clear pieces of this thing. Uh, in, in Ganemiro's uh, um, uh, American Dilemma of, of 44. So how did he how did he manage to do that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, we see it in, you know, in other places as well. I mean, we go back to Marcus Garvey, right? There's a great, there's a great speech uh, that was available. I mean, there's an audio file of it. You can actually hear Garvey speaking and you can hear the crowd interacting with him. It's something I used to teach a lot with, with students in intro level classes. But there's a there's a moment where Garvey is goading the audience about uh, their alcoholism, right? He's talking about how much they're into uh, Johnny Walker Red, you know, and Black, right? Both both <laughs> both labels, right? And there's you know the, the crowd erupts with laughter, right? I think in the case of of people like Garvey, a Malcolm X, a uh, Huey Newton, I mean these are people who are in it, right? They're immersed within communities in the case of, of uh, you know, Newton, he's in Oakland. He is somebody who has lived a particular kind of life. I think the difference between Newton and uh, a Moynihan or even Newton and the new right, you know, much later who would, who would mobilize the very same notions to dismantle the welfare state is that he, he sees this as uh, a, a condition right? It's not something that's intrinsic. It's something that's capable of being transformed, right? In the same sense that he, I guess, sees himself as having been politicized, right? And moved in a particular direction. I think that's always been the case, right? I mean, there are empirical realities, you know, in, in oppressed uh, communities. But the, the, the problem you know, at least from the liberal sort of underclass notion that's invented by and popularized by Moynihan and others during the, the 50s and 60s, that their arguments suspend in many ways um, serious consideration of how this is connected to political economy, right? Even though, you know, there's moments when Moynihan tips his hat, right? He's, he's clear about discrimination, he's clear about certain structural features of American life during that period. But when it comes to prescribing solutions, he turns towards you know, uh, behavioral modification and, and uh, policy that does not really drive into uh, changes in the economy, right? And I think with Newton, we get both. We have somebody who is aware that there's the, you know, they're the brothers on the block is I think the phrase he uses in a few places uh, and, and the behavior of that that culture or subculture, but at the same time, you know, he has this eye towards, you know, the transformative politics and the internationalist left politics that he sees as possible, you know, during that, during that moment. Mm -hmm. I think this is a good moment to turn to, to Lori um, to, to ask her about her, her journey uh, with, with Toni Morrison over the past decade. Well, I want to begin by echoing um, the thanks to Jenny, to Allison, and to Caroline for organizing this. I realized that um, organizing a virtual event can be as logistically complex <laughs> as organizing an in-person event, and I appreciate um, the, all of the work that went into this event. So for me, the invitation to be part of this um, project was a, really a starting point for a whole new kind of direction in my thinking. Um, one piece of Melvin and Chip's original vision that I, I especially appreciated was that for many of us, it was an opportunity to dive into the work of figures who had been important to our own work, but about whom we had never written. Um, so uh, Morrison, um, particularly as a literary theorist and as a writer of nonfiction, um, was someone who taught me how to read when I was in graduate school. Um, she uh, provided a guide um, in her thinking about the American literary canon, really provided a guide to how to think about a tradition of political thought 
um, that both evaded and relied on racial categories. Um, what I discovered as I began doing the work for this um, piece was the degree to was as I spent much more time with her fiction. So Morrison published eleven novels during her lifetime was the ways in which um, her novels provide a kind of site or a map for exploring the lived meaning of concepts like freedom, like power, like democracy, um, but from the vantage of the enslaved, the dispossessed, um, the, the people she calls unchosen. Um, and I think this is crucial both in the ways in which she reconstructs history. Um, her novels from Beloved Forward are deeply researched um, and they, um, bring to life worlds that are outside of official histories and standard narratives um, of the, um, the begin the origins and development of American life. But she also um, uses her imaginative gifts to um, to conjure worlds uh, and and forms of relation that don't exist, haven't existed, um, and especially groups of women who come together, um, outside of official power and create forms of fleeting forms of community. Um, these are often violently disrupted. They aren't permanent, but they provide a glimpse, I think, of um, an alternative to the status quo. And as a side point, I should note that um, rereading these pieces, um, one thing that struck me was that among the common themes across figures as different as Huey Newton and Anna Julia Cooper, um, was um, this idea of relationality. So whether it's the radical relation, relationality that Carol talks about or intercommunalism, um, which is, you know, has a more explicit critique of political economy um, or the call and response structure of David Walker's appeal um, and the relational equality that Chip talks about. I think um, part of what Morrison is able to do when she enters fictional worlds is to create a picture um, what, of what that, uh, what an alternative way of, of um, organizing power and organizing relationship um, might look like. Um, when I was trying to think about what to say um, about the essay and about Morrison's political thought, uh, I went back and noticed there was a sentence in the, um, in the piece where I talk about Beloved and um, note that Morrison's novels regard the land from the vantage of the hunted, not the hunters. And that's, um, that's something that you know, has been part of my thinking, but not really very central. Um, and until relatively recently, when I came to appreciate the degree to which um, the language of hunting and the language of prey um, is so um, is so formative for Morrison's fiction and her nonfiction essays that um, it is um, it is central because I think she sees it as a defining uh, a feature of a modern world that's built from um, the Atlantic slave trade, chattel slavery, and colonialisms of many kinds. So she's really. Um, as she thinks about what it could mean to be free or to get free, she's continually engaging this question of um, what it means to be uh, forced to be on the move, to be an outlaw, to be um, hunted in various ways. And I think especially to go back to, um, you know, Melvin's comment about democracy on the ropes, um, she helps us to think about, you know, what does it mean to inhabit a democratic society whose constitution has a fugitive slave clause built into its original um, feature, um, into its original writing. And I think this is, this is a feature of Morrison's work that is especially important today because it illuminates um, the question um, of who belongs and the question of forced movement as a central uh, problem for political life. Um, in the last 15 years or so of her life, she uh, continually asked the question, who is the foreigner and where is the foreigner's home? And I think there are ways in which, um, you know, in a time of forced migration, of massive eviction and of the violent policing of borders, this dimension of her work 
is something that helps us to see why um, Angela Davis and Farrah Jasmine Griffin um, celebrated her as a revolutionary political thinker um, at the time of her death. That's it. <laughs> Laurie, can I just follow up on on one one of the most sort of most striking you know phrases from your chapter is when you you, you discuss the criminality of the context and specifically it refers it's on five fifty five and it refers to the climactic scene in Beloved uh, and you're showing how different you know some previous readings haven't given quite enough emphasis to the criminality of the context um, and you and you you think that's actually where the emphasis should be placed. But the one of the things that's striking about the phrasing is that it, the criminality of context, you know, partly also sort of seems to be what the, the, the a large amount of the African American tradition of African American political thought reveals. And so you've worked on Baldwin and Du Bois, and now Morrison. You know, how do you think about sort of the cr criminality of context as being not only a, a, a lesson of Morrison but also a larger lesson of this tradition? Okay, no, that's that's really um, that's really helpful. I I think uh, part of the way I think about it um, maybe separates uh, Morrison and um, other thinkers. Although I suspect you and I will disagree about this. Uh, that that's actually both Chip and Melvin, and <laughs> will disagree with what I have to. Say. Um, I think Morrison. Um, gives us a, um, she's, it's not an anti-Americanism, but it's an, you know, a deep anti-nationalism. And so that there, you know, just as Baldwin in The Fire Next Time, you know, talks about the danger of flags and altars. And um, so I think for Morrison, um, the, the point is that a redeemed America cannot be the response to the criminality of the context, uh, which is not to say that um, she is, um, ad, you know, planning to pick up as Du Bois did, and you know, ultimately, um, at the end of his life, and say, you know, chin up, you know, and know that the American Negro cannot win, um, but rather to shift our attention away from the idea of America or any national ideal as um, the repository for our, um, you know, for the possibility of freedom, uh, which is, is interestingly, I mean, I think she is deeply committed to democratic ways of living and social organization, but she worries a great deal about the worship of the nation. And um, this is why I think she puts, um, she puts less emphasis than um, many thinkers on citizenship as a key category because it is always also tied to, um, you know, those violent forms of policing and exclusion. That um, her focus on not only um, racial slavery but also the dispossession of indigenous people in the U.S. always um, always undercuts. So Chip, should we um, open it up at this uh, at this point, Jenny? You want to open it up at the yeah, we can do yeah. that. Okay. Um, yeah. So just as a reminder, if people want to ask a question live, um, please feel, feel free to let me know in the chat and I can start keeping a cue. Um, alternatively, if you want to write your question into the chat box, I'm also happy to read it aloud. Um, so the first question um, comes from Jacob Leverson um, and it's been written into the chat. So I'm going to go ahead and read it aloud. Um, what role has Black nationalism played in reconfiguring the politics of the welfare state and improving on the idea of inclusive markets? What role can Black nationalism continue to play in making these types of improvements? Cedric, you want to? Um, I think it's the uh, closest to your thematic. You want to? You want to? Uh, or Walker? Uh, it, it, yeah, it is. But the welfare state—that's going to be. Uh, Yeah, I can I can try to answer it. I um I mean maybe I might need to hear a little bit more about uh 
you know, why, why would this be an expectation, right? In, in my sense of Black nationalism historically, and there's different permutations of it, right? Different, you know, variations or historical uh, manifestations of Black nationalism, at least during the 1960s and, and 70s. Um, for some Black nationalist tendencies, right? They run counter. The logic of the runs counter to this idea of even trying to shape the welfare state's outcomes, right? The Nation of Islam is not concerned about the welfare state during the 50s and 60s, right? Or now. Um, the Nation of, of Islam is concerned about building its own separate um, institutions. You know, uh, their focus is not on, you know, pushing the welfare state in one direction or another. You, you do find uh, a bit later, and maybe this is where, where the question is, is emerging from, some Black nationalist oriented figures who um, want to use or mobilize the state to achieve some of their ends, right? And so um, maybe the best example of this you know, with the, the 64 uh, Economic Opportunity Act and the kind of grants that were provided to uh, locales, um, organizations like uh, Harlem Youth Opportunities Unlimited, or HARU, uh, included all sorts of Black nationalist figures like Amiri Baraka, who, who used some of that grant money to to uh, you know, organize different kinds of events and activities in, in New York and elsewhere, right? Um, you've also got folks like Floyd McKissick, who uh, again also relies on you know, federal support, state level support to try to create this, this um, greenfield, uh, a town sprung out of a greenfield, right? Soul City. Um, and you, and you have people like even one of my mentors as a kid, uh, Father Albert McKnight, who was originally from uh, Bed-Stuy. He claims that his, his family was one of the first Black families to move into Bed-Stuy when they did, uh, who becomes a Black Catholic minister and you know goes on to form cooperatives, mainly among uh, sweet potato farmers in Louisiana but also other cooperatives throughout the South, right? And, and creates a, the Southern Development Foundation, right? So there are moments where some Black nationalist figures engage the state uh, in a way, I'm not sure if that gets at the question that, that this, uh, that, that's been raised here, but for the most part, I would argue that some, some Black nationalist manifestations don't wanna be bothered with the welfare state. If anything, they want to, to do something completely uh, different. Yeah, I mean, behind the, you know, behind the question, I mean, you know, you know, for this tradition, even if many permutations, um, there's just an out and out um, denial that the markets could be inclusive in the first place with respect to, um, with respect to black folks. So there are conceptions of welfare and uplift, um, economic uplift, um, internal to uh, the tradition of black nationalism, um, but it is not from the perspective of deploying the the, the the powers of the the powers of the state. Great. So the next question comes from Amy Geis. Hi everyone. Um, it's great to be with you all, um, and great to be with the the editors and the panelists, and I'll echo Cedric's um, sentiment of how, how special it is to be um, engaging with the people that I've been thinking with on the page. Um, so thanks for being here today. Um, I wanted to circle back to something that Melvin said in his kind of introductory comments about engaging with African-American thought um, and, and approaching it um, acknowledging radical vulnerability um, and what it means to do that well. Um, so I'm teaching um, the African-American political thought class right now at Wash U. And as we're kind of engaging with these various thinkers, I, I sometimes see students taking up various um, kind of 
um, the more radical positions on it, right? So one being um, sometimes they're suspicious of these figures in the sense of that they, they're constantly thinking, well, given the radical vulnerability of someone like Douglas, who really wasn't able to exactly say what he really wanted to say, right, because of um, potential danger and harm, right, they're constantly kind of wondering not about what's on the page, but what's not on the page. And then on the other side of that, there's this, there's this almost insistence on, um, and really I think a genuine um, hope to kind of give these thinkers that their, their ideas and to want to deny that vulnerability and suggest that um, we might get too preoccupied by their vulnerability or potential danger and how it's informing their ideas and what they do put on the page. And, um, and those seem to be like the two extremes. And I think many of the, um, the authors in the volume, right, are kind of trying to think in between. I'm thinking about Desmond Jagmahan's piece on Booker T. Washington and how um, he's thinking about the ways that these figures are negotiating their own security while also really engaging deeply with ideas and politics, right? Um, so I wonder for the panel, uh, maybe you guys can help me be a, a good, better teacher next week, how um, we might think about engaging with a tradition, an intellectual tradition that um, is grounded on this reality of um, radical vulnerability and racial domination. I mean, one, one thing I'll, I'll just want to start with, and uh, thank you for kind words. I mean, I really admire your work. Um, um, one one thing that you know I think is true of a number of these thinkers is they are their act of writing is forming new publics, and in the formation of new publics, in some ways there's increased security against vulnerability. Um, and so I think I you know I, I think the vulnerable vulnerability point is absolutely undeniable. Um, but when we think about the way in which um, uh, these 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 thinkers are reaching out in order to form uh, new literary publics and to create new solidarities, that's a way of um, of, of guarding against vulnerability in a in a very sort of communal way. So I think it's I mean that's just one possible way of responding to the dilemma. Carol. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for that question. I would like to add that uh, in the case of Anna Georgia Cooper, I think that notion of radical vulnerability comes about through her um, understanding of the plight of Black women when she was writing and her intersectional analysis. Um, I find it fascinating that a lot of people don't see Cooper as radical, <laughs> um, but I think that her very fascinating um, refusal to allow any type of vulnerability in the United States um, to be separated from other forms of vulnerability. And in her collection of essays, she talks about the um, silencing of black women and the violence, not just by dominant culture, but even by within black culture. And so it's layers and layers of vulnerability that often went unnoticed. So I think that's one way of looking at it within her work. And because she tends to be a bit more positive, people don't see that as radical. It's very interesting that you have to be have a particular posture in to be considered radical to some extent, um, but she, and and her community activism, a number of ways that she tried to address that type of vulnerability. She she was a prototypical intersectional um, analytical thinker. Thank you. Lori. Wanted to follow up on that. I mean, one of the things that I think that's so striking about the idea that Anna Julia Cooper wasn't, you know, a radical thinker is, um, even though I think one of the, the the really wonderful 
things about your essay, Carol, is the way in which she's so much more than a voice from the South. I mean, you, you give um, her whole career, but but a voice from the South came out the year that you know that lynchings reached a high point in the U.S. So it's the idea that she could, you know, write with that voice um, in that moment. I think is quite extraordinary. Um, one thing about Morrison's work, and and particularly as a figure who's who's operating across the lines of of nonfiction criticism and fiction, is that. Her emphasis on um, what she calls the interior lives of Black women and men provides a space for exploring vulnerability without reducing anyone to their vulnerability. I mean, I think it's a so it provides a way to think about the structural um, uh, forces that are shaping their lives. I mean, she was anti-capitalist as well as, um, you know, a keen analyst of, of racial and gender um, oppression. But at the same time, um, insofar she's dwelling with the complexity of human beings assessing their circumstances, um, it's, you know, it, it puts vulnerable, it makes vulnerability important, but it puts it in its place. It's not the whole of anyone's life. It's it's a condition that they have to, um, you know, within which they have to negotiate um, the terms of their lives. All right, um, the next question is from Ferris Lupino. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to see uh, some familiar faces here. And uh, I just want to say before I ask my question that I really love this volume. I've been reading it sort of back and forth for a year. I encourage everyone to get a coffee if they don't have one already. Um, so I have a question sort of for everybody. Um, as I was rereading the intro, I was thinking a lot about this term of provisional canon and the sort of canon making project of the volume. And so one thing that I'm sort of struck by with each individual chapter is that they, they kind of have this double function. They kind of introduce uh, newcomers to the thinker. And at the same time, they're kind of at the vanguard of like the ongoing debates about the thinker at the same time, which seems like kind of a delicate dance to do. Like you could imagine it's just the sort of lit review sort of intro, or it's like not really concerned. It's it's like go catch up elsewhere and then meet us here. So uh, for for each of the sort of writers, the for all of you, I guess I'm kind of curious if there was any sort of deliberate move of striking that balance and uh, thinking about that as a sort of move in the uh, sort of game of canonization. I guess is a way of saying it. Like because this is a project of canonization you are the canonizers. So how did you approach that task of canonizing? Uh, and then from the, for the, for Chip and Melvin as the sort of editors, if, if you could also just say a little bit about what you take to be the stakes of that provisional canon. So I don't, you know, I don't know, uh, the other panelists can speak for themselves, but I'm putting Chip and I together. I don't know that Lori, Carol and Cedric we're thinking in terms of, um, but they'll tell us uh, in terms of canon talk. Um, we, you know, when we tasked them and invited them um, to write on this or that thinker, um, um, because these are sort of extraordinary uh, scholars in their own right, the aim was both to help orient the reader, but to make sure that, that you have carved out the space to give your own distinctive take take on the finger and to do it in such a way, um, um, we hope to do it in such a way that others would have to come to these texts um, as they, to these, to these uh, uh, chapters as they were trying to figure out Newton um, uh, or, or, or Morrison, right, or Lord. Um, and, and so, uh, uh, so that's the first thing. I think the second thing is, is that Chip and I, Chip and I now knew, and Chip can get in on this, that there is no escaping that when you put a volume like this together, someone off in the shadows are like, oh, they put together a canon, this, right? So we wanted to confront it head on. 
Um, and, to, and to say that, to say two things. One, that this volume is really about the formation of a kind of intellectual attention. To say that there's a way in which we have focused on a tradition of theorizing that has excluded these people. And by putting a volume together like this, we're trying to reform, reshape attention. Don't look there, look here. And in saying, don't look there, look here, we wanted to say there are some signature figures that we think you will have to, that you will have to go through. But insofar as traditions are always unfolding, um, this, this, is, this is really meant to be uh, a temporary move. It is meant to be an invitation uh, for others to say, wait a second, as one of my colleagues sent me a note, ah, this, you know, um, a lot of radical folks not like why is Cruz not in here um, and go through a list of a whole series of other figures that are that are that are missing that are missing from the 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 the, the, the volume so we know uh, uh, that you know that we couldn't escape canon talk but um, we thought that there was a way to talk about it that was um, uh, the beginning of a conversation rather than a conversation stopper yeah I mean Melvin's captured very well and I, mean, I think one thing that's really important to know about the volume is that look there's there is not unanimity at all um, about proper methodological approaches to these subjects there's a shared enthusiasm for the subject um but you know we, we, melvin and i when we wrote the introduction we shared it with a limited number of readers who were you know some like Lori, were going to be very skeptical of of you know some of our um, interpretive choices, you know, others, you know, who were more sympathetic. Um, but um, but we, we knew we weren't going to be able to write an introduction and we're going to be able to satisfy the, even a constituency of our own contributors. I mean, there's no way. And whenever we opened up the question, when we were meeting with contributors, I mean, they were full of reasons why we were doing the role volume wrong. You know, um, they had all sorts of uh, criticisms, you know, to our approach and, you know, Melvin and I would leave the room and we're like, well, you know, well, we're going to we need to get a new set of authors. So, um, um, but, uh, but the, you know, I think that the, the, the pluralism of the volume is actually one of the things um, that we're most proud of, um, that we, we, we included a, a, a very large number of different interpretive approaches. Um, I think everyone stretched themselves in certain ways. Um, and I think the two sort of words I would emphasize on the, on the canon question is first off provisional. And um, you know, uh, both Melvin, you know, um, and I are very dewy in on this, although I can never be as dewy in as Melvin is, um, which is that, you know, all of our conclusions are only provisional and always subject to revision. And um, and with the democratic commitments we have, um, we, we guard against, we, we do institutionalization, but we're also not gonna over-institutionalize and try to snuff out other approaches. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the first you know, important P word. The second important P word is provocation. Um, you know, what we would like to see is in 10 to 15 years, we wanna see four or five competing volumes this is how Rogers and Turner got it wrong. This is an alternative vision. And, you know, and so, you know, sometime someone asked this question last year of like, well, you know, what do you want the status of this volume to be in, you know, 20 years? And we said, we want the status of the volume to be obsolete. Um, and so we, 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 we feel like we're trying to cultivate um, a, a common ground and we would be happy, you know, to be eclipsed. Um, on the question of, you know, Mel, I mean, Ferris, you have got it absolutely right. And what we asked authors to do is that we said they had to do two things, which is first, they need to provide some sort of synoptic overview. And secondly, they also need to provide their own sort of angle of vision. And we knew it was very difficult. And, um, and, uh, and basically, as, as everyone struggled with it, the question was, how can you find an angle of vision that would happen to provide an overview? Um, and, you know, I struggled greatly with the, the chapter on Lord, um, tremendous struggling with that piece, but ultimately, you know, where I get, where it came out is, uh, is a, is a discussion of the four senses of difference in Lord, you know, would not only sort of help us understand it, uh, you know, one of her key terms, um, but would also give us a, a synoptic overview 
of her commitments and of their ethical foundation. All right, um, so we have a question from Jay Sexton who is watching this with the History MA students all together. Um, he says, Cedric Johnson got the Atlantic History MA room thinking. To what extent should black political thought be framed in national terms? We liked the connection to decolonization and thought about how 19th century black political thought and activity was also trans transatlantic or transimperial in nature. So the question is, is to what extent should we think about black political thought as, as national or international? Yeah, it says to what extent should black political thought be framed in national terms? Question mark. That is like the essence of the question. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's always been, I think the answer to the, the question, right? It's always been international in many respects, right? I mean, we go back to the 19th century, you've got you know, figures like uh, Edward Wilmot Blyden, who is, you know, thinking about um, Black struggle in the United States as, as paralleled with Zionism, right? So you, you have all sorts of different um, connections, right? I mean, people like uh, Mary Ann Shad Carey, who is advocating migration to uh, Canada, right? So I think, um, yeah, it's it's not it's never really been exclusively national, right? There's always been international dimensions. Um, so yeah, I don't know, I don't I don't know what to say besides that. It's, there's always been that that dimension of it, right? That we can talk about Pan Africanism, um, we can talk about the kind of left internationalism that existed, you know, during the, the 60s and 70s. Um, you know, and even now, right? You know, in the last two years, we've seen with uh, the second wave of Black Lives Matter, you know, uh, 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 after the killing of George Floyd, you know, global protest in, in solidarity with, uh, with Black Lives Matter. So I don't, yeah, I don't really have a, much else to say besides that. Lori. So I just had one one thought um, about that, that that was in some ways prompted by um, by a reaction I got to a reading of part of, of, of some other work I've done on on Morrison and Morrison gave an interview with Paul Gilroy um, in the late 80s, where um, she said, you know, I don't really identify as American. Um, and she talked about a much more kind of diaspora consciousness and one of the people who was in this particular workshop said, well, that's that's just wrong. I mean, her work is so American. You know, if you read The Bluest Eye, it is all Lorraine, Ohio, or the Great Migration. And, and I think what they couldn't see was that um, part of what I think is so distinctive is that, first of all, the American terrain is understood in, um, in terms that exceed any kind of national frame. So both um, the attentiveness to um, settler colonialism, the idea that this is not some project that emerges you know, anew as Thomas Paine imagined it, um, but also the connectedness to um, colonial projects. Um, in Morrison's case, the, the figure of the um, veteran is really critical the kind of cosmopolitanism of being conscripted to fight, you know, to save democracy around the world in, you know, what were effectively imperial projects of various kinds. So, I mean, one, one piece of this, and I think this is also true of Du Bois, for instance, before, you know, even at the very beginning, his first book is on the Atlantic slave trade. Um, so understanding the national always seems to depend heavily um, for many of these thinkers on situating um, situating the national within global um, transits of violence, of commerce, of, of political exchange. I mean, I think one of the things this, this I think Laura is absolutely right. I mean, one of the things, you know, I think, uh, you know, David Walker's title, appeal to the colored citizens of the world, but in particular and very expressly of the United States. 
And for him, this does not seem to be a confusion at all. Um, so I, so I, you know, one of the things to uh, wonder about is an important question. One of the things to wonder about is when we sort of raise the question of uh, black political thought uh, or African American political thought in the in a national frame, how are we treating the um, um, national, the nation in this respect? Is the nation meant to function uh, interpretably as exhaustive? Well, if it's going to do that kind of work, then we're going to run into problems. Um, or is or is it meant to be denotative of a relative position? Right, that could be understood in relation to international communities uh, and the like. And more often than not in this tradition, from Phyllis Wheatley all the way down to, to, to Cornell West, um, it, 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 there, much of this tradition, Morrison is great at this, is an attempt to sort of um, uh, uh, cultivate ways of seeing in which the nation only has relative value. Um, or in which is, its importance is cast into relief in some instances, but in other instances might be thrown into the, into the background and thus in Baldwin's way, guarding against a kind of uh, fetishizing of the, of the nation, a kind of uh, deep affective attachment to it such that you can't see the humanity of, uh, of, uh, of others, right? I would like to add, I agree with both Laurie and Melvin in terms of Cooper, she, um, she did her dissertation on the French um, understanding of slavery and the, what she perceived as the um, disjunction between their ideas of liberty and um, what was going on in France. And that inflects how she thinks about some of the um, democratic principles that she writes about in some of her essays. So she's always, set in some of her idea of this transformed America within the larger context of what's going on in various parts um, around the world, especially Western Europe, and also in light of Haiti and some of the other um, revolutions that are going to be occurring. So she has that inflection of international um, awareness in her work as well. All right, um, and we have a question from Kevin Duong. Thanks for everyone's presentation. I feel a little bit like an interloper here, so maybe I'll ask a weird question. Um, I was wondering, and this is, it's actually partly jumping off of something that Cedric Johnson said. I was, I, and it kind of builds on the last question too, which is I wonder whether any of you all as contributors felt like American, African-American political thought was distinctively shaped by, I don't know how else to describe it, except as like this, the numbers problem. So that African-Americans were a numerical minority in the United States in contrast to say African traditions of political thought in which they could presume by sheer number majority status. And the immediate reason I'm asking about that is like questions like vanguardism and economic democracy. I think of an app and like, I only mostly know the Francophonie context, but it was framed very much in terms of conquering state power because they had the numbers. And so like the relationship between political democracy and economic democracy got configured in a slightly different way because of like sheer demographics, basically. And so I'm wondering whether you could reflect on whether kind of going the reverse direction, whether there is a kind of specificity to African-American political thought because it's kind of bound up with a particular demographic and numerical condition. I mean, I, I, if, unless Cedric wants to go first, I, I, I could take a stab at that. Um, you know, I, to be honest, I mean, sort of part of the way that Melvin and I think about it, this comes really out of, and I hope I can speak for Melvin on this. You, you tell me if I'm wrong. It really comes out of the, the Black Studies Department at Amherst College in the 1990s. Um, where you had David Blight, Robert Good Williams, and Jeffrey Ferguson, alongside a number of other uh, really important scholars working alongside each other. It was intellectually, it was very fecund. And one of the things, you know, especially David and Jeff really identified coming out of sort of the Nathan Huggins approach to American history, 
um, which I alluded to in my introduction. But I think one of the things that's really important to understand about that, part of what, you know, in the, in the 80s and 90s, when that intervention was happening, um, part of what African-American studies about was about at that time was about the recovery of the disavowed, uh, what has been disavowed in American history and uh, recovering um, the constituent elements of American life that are seen as aren't seen as American. Now that's sort of very much bound up with this problem of the status of the minority in a majoritarian democracy. And so I, th I, I think that you're absolutely right. Um, and, and there, there are times also in, in, in African American thought where there's a struggle, you know, to figure out is our oppression the result of the fact of anti blackness, or is our oppression in this case the result of the fact that we're 12 to 13 percent of the population um and and how are those two problems you know uh conjoined so you know i think that you're you're absolutely right that part of the the what what's sort of distinctive about um you know the the african-american political uh tradition is working from this minoritarian position within a constitutional democracy and there being disagreements about whether or not the, the terms of of uh, constitutional democracy are are redeemable i wonder whether um there are also um different answers at different moments so i this earlier this week um I taught Walker's appeal and, you know, thinking about a moment when for many of the enslaved, had they, you know, had they risen up at, you know, in parts of what were then the, the you know, the early Republic, they had the numbers. Um, so it's also a kind of a, an, an interesting, it's a very different problem from the one that, you know, that Cedric writes about when he talks about, you know, armed resistance in the 1960s and 1970s. Um. Well, the one thing I would just say on that to, to Lori is that, the, in, the, yes, in localities, they definitely had the numbers. The difficulty is that the U.S. Constitution is, is you know, at, from its inception, it's a pact to suppress slave insurrection. And so as soon as, you know, the, st the state's localities uh, uh, enter into the constitutional democracy, they're entering into, enter into a pact for one state to come to the assistance of another if a slave insurrection is occurring. And so, uh, which is something I have to constantly emphasize with my students, like, well, why doesn't slavery ever appear, you know, in, in, in the term, the word of the constitution, but the, the, the function, the, 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 the functional element of the constitution of uh, functioning against, you know, uh, the possibility of slave insurrection is, it's just, it's built into the very structure. If I can, I'll chime in. Um, I think the, the problem of the, you know, Blacks being a numerical minority, right? Um, it's it's a in the case of of Newton. Let me talk about Newton, and then I'll give a broader broader uh, point about it. In the case of Newton, I think the bigger issue is is the the growing conservatism that he he's witnessing of of whites, right? Um, and and we know that this is the very same period that people like Ted Allen and Noel Ignatieff and others begin talking about uh, white skin privilege, right? The very same period that Newton is talking about blacks as a as a vanguard. And so I think it has to be understood, like the, the problem has to be understood within that broader um, condition of the affluent society and the making of post-war suburbia. Um, I think it's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, uh, a bit of a problem here, right? So on the one hand, we're talking about African-American politics, African-American uh, political thought, African-American political traditions. But we always have to stop, right? Because when we're talking about politics, politics, uh, the basis of it is not necessarily identity, right? The basis of politics and political life, as I've understood it, it has always been interest. And so even if we're talking about the 19th century, um, when it comes to the politics of abolitionism, there would be no end of slavery if it was left up only to, uh, you know, free Blacks you know, to be the primary uh, advocates of the end of, of, uh, of slavery. 
during the reconstruction period, right? This, this, this uh, fragile freedom that's experienced by, by Blacks throughout the, the Deep South. And there are moments of alliance that are meaningful, even before the, the Plessy decision, right? The, the 1892 New Orleans dock workers strike was a biracial strike, right? That involved, you know, um, black stevedores. Uh, and I think those, those kinds of, of moments are lost if the overwhelming framing is one of a black ethnic politics that, that's durable and lasts from one historical juncture to another. Um, and the same is true during the, during the period of the, the so-called second reconstruction, right? That there's a moment where in many cities, um, black people are becoming the, the majority, right? And, and so it reorients um, black politics in the way of black power, but even then uh, it becomes quickly clear. And this is the point I was you know, getting at earlier about Huey Newton, it becomes clear that that in and of itself, because of politics being interest driven, is not an adequate way of advancing, um, in particular, the interests of, of working class Black people, right? That once they've, they've succeeded in electing representatives to the mayor's office and to uh, city council and other positions, um, oftentimes those officials find themselves standing at odds with uh, what may be the real concerns of uh, the vast majority of, of Black people living in places like Detroit, uh, Chicago, and elsewhere. So I just think that there's a, there's a way that we should talk about African-American um, political history and African-American politics, you know, with clear limitations and with an eye towards discrete historical interests as they, they manifest and can be, can be understood. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna exercise my own prerogative as the moderator and I'm going to ask a question and it's for the panel. Um, it, I'm gonna ask a question that sort of extrapolates us to sort of our contemporary political moment. Um, I mean, I think there does seem to be something important about the fact that, um, I mean, we're hosting this round table during Black History Month and we're doing it at a moment where we're seeing um, more and more books by Black authors being taken out of school libraries, right? For example, just up the road here in Wentzville, Missouri, um, the school board pulled Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye and Kiese Lehman's Heavy from the high school uh, library there. They also pulled like Alison Bechtel's Fun Home and also George Johnson's All Boys Ain't Blue. Um, and my understanding is that the, school, the students are now suing the school over this decision. Um, and then just this week, the Lieutenant Governor of Texas held a press conference where he said, um, he would pledge to ban the teaching of critical race theory in universities. And this was in response, right, to the faculty at UT Austin reaffirming their academic freedom to teach about race, gender, and critical race theory. So, you know, one of the things I'd love to hear about really from all the panelists along um, is how, you know, you as scholars think of, um, as scholars and teachers think about um, the value of, of studying and, and, and teaching black political thought um, in this particular moment that we find ourselves in. Mm. So um, I guess I'll say a word. I don't know if I have a well-formed thought uh, on this. I mean, it you know, it's, it's actually related, Laurie, to your piece on, on Morrison. Um, there's a line uh, in your essay on Morrison where uh, you say that Morrison, um, she doesn't um, uh, romanticize the past and she's also not interested in vindicating it. Um, and so then it, it raises a question for Morris, Morrison, but indeed for all of the thinkers in this tradition, um, um, how do they think we ought to stand to the past, right? As we, as we try to um, be responsive to the economic, political, psychological needs of the present, uh, of the present moment. And so I find this, you know, I enjoyed teaching this tradition, talking about uh, these figures, in part because for me, they represent an alternative thread within the tradition of American moral and political practice. An alternative tradition about how we should stand to the past um, in order to engage in reimagining um, imagining the present and the future. And they take this not to be 
something that's external to um, a, a, a liberal democratic society, but something that is thought to be constitutive, constitutive of it. Um, and, and so, you know, here is a moment um, where we are right now. Um, I mean, we've always had trouble dealing with the past, but, but it seems that we're in a, in a, in a key moment in which we're, in which we're struggling um, with doing that because this is Baldwin, of course, grappling with that past means that you gotta take responsibility for it. You gotta realize that you're partly <laughs> scarred by it um, and that it is, it is constantly shaping your present. And that is that sits at odds. And here I'm speaking philosophically, but, but we also see it practically, it sits at odds with another dominant motif uh, in, uh, in, this, in this tradition in which I'm only responsible for what I've done in the, in, in the present, uh, in, in which there is no limit uh, to what we can do, um, in which the very meaning of the project is bound up um, with, with redemption, right? Um, Toni Morrison is telling us we gotta let it go. Right? Baldwin is saying we gotta let it go, right? Um, Newton is saying we gotta let it go, right? So this is what, I mean, this is what I find you know, useful about this tradition, why I think we should be uh, consulting it at this very moment. I think I would, I would add, I mean, I, I, I agree with, uh, with Melvin. I think um, the state of Black studies and, and discussing the things that we do or doing the things that we do intellectually and in, as professors, as faculty, um, it's compounded, right, uh, by a few things. I mean, one is, uh, I think there's, there's um, the loss of maybe the kind of power that somebody like a Morrison represented, not just as a writer, um, but as an editor, right? Somebody who, who headed up a major uh, press. And I think, I mean, maybe, maybe Laura can answer this. I think she may have been the first Black woman to take a post, uh, you know, as editor at a major trade press, right? Um, and, at a, and she creates space for Angela Davis and Huey Newton and other folks to publish during this period. So we've lost, I think, that in some ways, but we're living through a period right now. I mean, Black Studies is taking a beating for sure, but I mean, having been at this full time for over 20 years now, I mean, you know, any intellectualism, in the culture, and we could point to a lot of different sources. I mean, we could talk about social media, we could talk about conspiracy theory and the way in which it's pro proliferated, but there's a, there's a disdain for expertise, mm -hmm. um, for science and investigation, for uh, serious intellectual work. Um, I think attention spans are shorter. I make mean, it go on a whole, you know, curmudgeonly rant about this, but I just think that the, the assault on critical race theory um, is part of a much broader deterioration, you know, uh, that is a serious threat to democracy, right? It's a serious threat to the kind of society that we live in. Um, and I don't think that the COVID-19, you know, pandemic has, has necessarily helped us, right? In some ways it's compounded some of the problems, uh, but maybe that's just my jaded, jaded view of things, but I'd be, I'd be curious what other folks are thinking. One thing I will say on the teaching question, um, you know, I teach, I teach most the black, most black political thought I teach is in, in a two core sequence in, in US political thought. Um, that I teach over two quarters. And in the last, in, in part two of that, that sequence, which runs from reconstruction to the present, you know, we spend, um, you know, a, a large unit at the end is on the civil rights movement, its critics. And we read MLK, Malcolm X, James Baldwin, Audre Lorde. And, um, and when in 2020, when it, we were in lockdown and was teaching it over Zoom, um, but it, you know, we those the teaching of those weeks ran up to the George, you know, the the George Floyd killing, and um, George Floyd killing, and in that week, you know, a number of colleagues across campus, we just you know canceled our normal curriculum and and had discussion groups and teach-ins, and but one of the things that I found was because they had read 
Baldwin Lord, MLK, Malcolm X, you know, in the weeks running up to that, those discussions, um, there are two things. First off, every newspaper in the country was saying, well, you need to go out and read James Baldwin and Audre Lorde, you know, that week. And, um, and so they felt empowered, you know, that they had already had those books under their belt. They also had Du Bois in Washington and Frederick Douglass under their belt from early in the quarter. Um, and so, so first having it was empowering for all sorts of students across all sorts of spectrums. Um, and secondly, because those, um, the, the, they had those books under their belt during that week, there was a usable pass that they could draw on in reflecting on George Floyd. And um, so, I mean, I think that I've always believed that, you know, that, that teaching the history of political thought is about providing students with, you know, a usable pass that they can draw on and use. And, um, and I think that, that there are a tremendous number of resources for a tremendous number of students for a tremendous number of different reasons. Um, in the Black tradition, and to, to echo what um, what Cedric said, you know, the assault on critical race theory at this time, um, it's it's an assault on self knowledge. Um, it's assault. It's an assault on self consciousness, and um, and at the same time, it's also unsurprising in that the the the, the, the so many dimensions of the culture have been so resistant to self-knowledge and self-consciousness for so long that it's just the latest eruption. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I think we have reached the end of our queue here. Um, I, I wanna just let the panel, I just wanna give the panelists one last opportunity to um, say anything in conclusion if they would like, um, but I, I will leave it to you and then we can probably close it out unless there's, I've missed some people in the chat box, but I'll just check, I don't think so. Okay. All right. Um, all right, well, thank you so much everyone for, for joining us. Um, please thank, um, join me in thanking the panelists for being with us today. Um, have a wonderful weekend, everyone, and uh, take good care. <laughs>